Hello everybody, this is A.W. Uh, continuing Franz Kafka's The Trial, moving on to chapter 2. If you remember, uh, well, and if you don't remember, then you definitely shouldn't be listening to this. Uh, uh, we went already over chapter 1, uh, the recording's there. Uh, I did notice, unfortunately, too late that uh, the volume was uh, not properly equalized, so I, I apologize for the quality of sound on that. Hopefully this is better, at least I hope it's better, I think I've tested uh, the volume uh, levels, uh, we will see. Once again, uh, just as uh, something to uh, tantalize, uh, titillate, uh, whatever you might call it, uh, hook you in. Uh, the thesis of my interpretation is that Joseph K. is guilty. Uh, already in the reading of chapter 1, we've gone over the things that are pointing out that uh, he's not a good person. And that uh, he's doing very strange things. Things that uh, unconsciously point towards his guilt. But anyways, let's get on with chapter 2. We'll just start reading. Kay was informed by telephone that there would be a small hearing concerning his case the following Sunday. He was made aware that these cross-examinations would follow one another regularly, perhaps not every week, but quite frequently. On the one hand, it was in everyone's interest to bring proceedings quickly to their conclusion, but on the other hand, every aspect of the examinations had to be carried out thoroughly without lasting too long because of the associated stress. For these reasons, it had been decided to hold a series of brief examinations following one another, following one after another. Sunday had been chosen as a day for the hearing so that Kay would not be disturbed in his professional work. It was assumed that he would be in agreement with this, but if he wished for another date then, as far as possible, he would be accommodated. Cross-examinations could even be held in the night, for instance, but Kay would probably not be fresh enough at that time. Anyway, as long as Kay had made no objection, the hearing would be left on Sundays. It was a matter of course that he would have to appear without fail. There was probably no need to point this out to him. He would be given the number of the building where he was to present himself, which was in the street in a suburb well away from the city centre, which Kay had never been to before. Once he had received this notice, Kay hung up the receiver without giving an answer. He had decided immediately to go there that Sunday. It was certainly necessary. Proceedings had begun, and he had to face up to it, and this first examination would probably also be the last. He was still standing and thought by the telephone when he heard the voice of the deputy director behind him. He wanted to use the telephone, but Kay stood in his way. Bad news, asked the deputy director, casually, not in order to find anything out, but just to get Kay away from the device. No, no, said Kay. He stepped to one side, but did not go away entirely. The deputy director picked up the receiver and, as he waited for his connection, turned away from it and said to Kay, One question, Mr. Kay. Would you like to give me the pleasure of joining me on my sailing boat on Sunday morning? There's quite a few people coming. You're bound to know some of them. One of them is Hester, the state attorney. Would you like to come along? Do come along. Kay tried to pay attention to what the deputy director was saying. It was of no small importance for him, as this invitation to the deputy director, with whom he had never got on very well, meant that he was trying to improve his relations with him. It showed how important Kay had become in the bank and how it its second most important official seemed to value his friendship, or at least his impartiality. He was only speaking at the side of the telephone receiver while he waited for his connection, but in giving this invitation, the deputy director was humbling himself. But Kay would have to humiliate him a second time as a result. He said, Thank you very much, but I'm afraid I will have no time on Sunday. I have a previous obligation. Pity, said the deputy director and turned to the telephone conversation that had just been connected. It was not a short conversation, but Kay remained standing confused by the instrument all the time it was going on. It was only when the deputy director hung up that he was shocked into awareness and said, in order to parse excuses standing there for no reason, I've just received a telephone call. There's somewhere I need to go, but they forgot to tell me what time. Ask them then, said the deputy director. 
It's not that important, said Kay, although in that way his earlier exercise, already weak enough, was made even weaker. As he went, the deputy director continued to speak about other things. Kay forced himself to answer, but his thoughts were mainly about that Sunday. How it would be best to get there for nine o'clock in the morning, as that was the time that courts always start work on weekdays. So, just quick commentary. He takes this trial stuff very seriously. He's already decided that it's serious enough. He's going to attend on Sunday. He wasn't told what time, but then he says uh, he's aware of this. He's being weird. He tries to make an excuse saying that indeed he was called. He was told to go somewhere. He wasn't told when. And they tell him, well, just call back and find out. And he's like, oh, it's not so serious. Indeed, not so serious for something so serious. Again, the world revolves around him. Yep. He doesn't have to obey the strictures of the world. So he's just going. He's just going to guess the time <laughs> for for a serious meeting. He's just going to guess at a time. You'll, you'll see, the, you, well, this already cropped up in chapter one, but you'll see this crop up a lot more. What was I? Uh, the weather was weather. dull on Sunday. Kay was very tired, as he had stayed out drinking until late in the night, celebrating with some of the regulars, and he had almost overslept, again, not being serious. He dressed hurriedly, without time to think, and assembled the various plans he had worked out during the week. With no breakfast, he rushed to the suburb he had been told about. Oddly enough, although he had little time to look around him, he came across three bank officials involved in his case, Rabensteiner, Kulik, and Kaminer. The first two were traveling in a tram that went across Kay's route, but Kaminer sat on the terrace of a cafe and leant curiously over the wall as Kay came over. All of them seemed to be looking at him, surprised at seeing their superior running. It was a kind of pride that made Kay want to go on foot. This was his affair, and the idea of any help from strangers, however slight, was repulsive to him. He also wanted to avoid asking for anyone's help, because that would initiate them into the affair, even if only slightly. And after all, he had no wish at all to humiliate himself before the committee by being too punctual. Anyway, now he was running so that he would get there by 9 o'clock, if at all possible, even though he had no appointment for this time. So, being stupid out of pride, <laughs> when it makes no sense, could have taken a tram, could have probably taken a horse and buggy, but no, he decides to run by there. And could have taken one of those uh, taxis, in chapter one. Uh, you know, he's, he's serious, he's like, I gotta get there by 9 o'clock, but he's like, I also don't want to be too punctual, because that would be humiliating. That's a weird thought. I mean, uh, again, contradictory thoughts and behaviors. Consciously tells himself it's not serious. And his behaviors in going through with it, this whole process, shows that he really thinks it's serious. You know, he knows it's something serious, or at least he believes deeply it's something serious, and yet he's, he's consciously, you know, in denial of it. Alright, uh, he had thought that he would recognize the building from a distance by some kind of sign, without knowing exactly what the sign would look like, or from some particular kind of activity outside the entrance. Kay had been told that the building was in Juliusstrasse, but when he stood at the street's entrance, it consisted on each side of almost nothing but monotonous grey constructions, tall blocks of flats occupied by poor people. Now, on a Sunday morning, most of the windows were occupied. Men in their shirt, leaves, shirt sleeves lent out smoking. Does I say lent or leant? Lent. Okay. Lent out it's smoking. It's like leaned, leaned, but lent out. Yeah. Mm lent out smoking or carefully and gently held small children on the sills. Other windows were piled with bedding above which the disheveled head of a woman would briefly appear. 
People called out to each other across the street. One of the calls provoked a loud laugh about Kay himself. It was a long street, and spaced evenly along it were small shops between the street level, selling various kinds of foodstuffs, which you reached by groping down. Uh, you reached by going down a few steps. One went in and out of them, or stood chatting on the steps. A fruit monger taking his goods up to the windows was just as inattentive as Kay, and it locked him, nearly knocked him down with his cart. Just then, a gramophone, which in better parts of town would have been seen as worn out, began to play some murderous tune. Alright, uh, murderous tune. Kay went, <laughs> yeah. Kay went further into the street slowly, as if he had plenty of time now, or as if the examining magistrate were looking at him from one of the windows and therefore knew that Kay had found his way there. It was shortly after nine. The building was quite far down the street. It covered so much area it was almost extraordinary, and the gateway in particular was tall and long. It was clearly intended for delivery wagons belonging to the various warehouses all around the yard, which were now locked up and carried by the and carried the names of companies, some of which Kay knew from his work at the bank. In contrast with his usual habits, he remained standing a while at the entrance to the yard, taking all these external details, taking in all these external details. Near him, there was a barefooted man sitting on a crate and reading the newspaper. There were two lads swinging on a handcart. In front of a pump stood a weak young girl in a bed jacket who, as the water flowed into her can, looked at Kay. There was a piece of rope stretched between two windows in a corner of the yard with some washing hanging on to dry. A man stood below it calling on instructions to direct the work yeah, to direct the work being done. Kay went over to the stairway to get to the room where the hearing was to take place, but then stood still again as besides these steps he could see three other stairway entrances, and there also seemed to be a small passageway at the end of the yard leading into a second yard. It irritated him that he had not been given more precise directions to the room. It meant they were either being especially neglectful with him or especially indifferent, and decided to make that clear to them very loudly and very unambiguously. In the end, he decided to climb up the stairs, his thoughts playing on something that he remembered the policeman, Willem, saying to him, that the court is attracted by the guilt, from which it followed that the court must be on the stairway that Kay selected by chance. As he went up, he disturbed a large group of children playing on the stairs who looked at him as he stepped up to the, through their rows. Next time I come here, he said to himself, I must either bring sweets with me or make them like me or stick to hit them with it. Or a stick to hit them with. <laughs> what? Hey, you gotta do something. Children are here. I gotta do something. You either gotta make them love me or hate me. Either one. He's gonna spoil them either way, with sweet the sweets or with the rod. <laughs> or so, sorry, him. spare the rod. <laughs> Sorry, I got a mess. <laughs> Just before he reached the first landing, he even had to wait a little while until a ball had finished its movement. Two small lads with sly face sly faces like grown ups, scoundrels held him by his trouser legs until it had Okay, that's it. Uh, Oh, uh, sorry, that, that was just a weird sentence. Uh, two small slads with sly faces, eh, sly faces like grown-up scoundrels held him by his trousers legs until it had it been the ball. Uh, if he were to shake them off, he would have to hurt them, and he was afraid of what noise they would make by shouting. So he wasn't afraid about hurting them, he was afraid of just <laughs> that people would uh, hear that and come looking and be like, hey you, quit beating up children. On the first floor, his search began for real. He still felt unable to ask for the investigating committee, and so he invented a joiner called Lance. That name occurred to him because the captain, Mr. Grubach's nephew, was called Lance, so that he could ask at every flat whether Lance the joiner lived there and thus obtain a chance to look into the rooms. It turned out, though, that that was most po mostly possible without further ado, as almost all the doors were left open and the children ran in and out. Most of them were small, one-windowed rooms where they also did the cooking. Many women held babies in one arm and worked at the stove with the other. Half-grown girls who seemed to be dressed in just their panaphores. 
recording is it? Four, a sleeveless apron like garment worn over a young girl's dress, typically having ties or buttons at the back. I think I know what that is. Actually, I think I saw somebody wear one today. You've seen them. Yeah, seems like something. Well, more common in the old days, but uh, <coughs> yeah. you still see them around today. It's like an Anne of Green Gables type of thing. So, uh, anyways, yet again, uh, this is something serious. He's with a bunch of strangers who he's never met. They don't know who he is. They don't even know his name. And he's wasting time instead of just asking where's the committee thing. Half-grown girls who seem to be dressed in just their pinaf pinafores worked the hardest, worked hardest running to and fro. In every room, the beds were still in use by people who were ill or still asleep, or people stretched out in them in their clothes. Kay knocked at the flats where the doors were closed and asked whether Lance, the joiner, lived there. It was usually a woman who opened the door, heard the inquiry, and turned to somebody in the room who would raise himself from the bed. The gentleman is asking if a joiner called Lance lives here. A joiner called Lance, he would ask from the bed. That's right, Kay would say, although it was clear the investigating committee was not to be found there, and so his task was at an end. There were many who thought it must be very important for Kay to find Lance the joiner, and thought long about it, naming a joiner who was not called Lance, or giving a name that had some vague similarity with Lance, or they asked neighbors or accompanied Kay to a door a long way away, where they thought someone of that sort might live in the back part of the building, or was someone who someone would be who could advise Kay better than they could themselves. Kay eventually had to give up asking if he did not want to be led all around the floor to floor in this way. He regretted his initial plan, which had at first seemed so practical to him. As he reached the fifth floor, he decided to give up the search, took his leave of a friendly young worker who wanted to lead him on still further, and went down the stairs. But then the thought of how much time he was wasting made him cross. He went back again and knocked at the first door on the fifth floor. The first thing he saw in the small room was a large clock on the wall, which already showed ten o'clock. Is there a joiner called Lance who lives here? he asked. Pardon? said a young woman with black, shining eyes, who was, at that moment, washing children's underclothes in a bucket. She pointed her wet hand toward the open door of the adjoining room. <coughs> Kay thought he had stepped into a meeting. A medium-sized, two-windowed room was filled with the most diverse crowd of people. Nobody paid any attention to the person who had just entered. Close under its ceiling, it was surrounded by a gallery which was also fully occupied and where the people could only stand bent down with their heads and their backs touching the ceiling. Kay, who found the air too stuffy, stepped out again and said to the young woman, who had probably misunderstood what he had said. I asked for a joiner, somebody by the name Vlance. Yes, said the woman, please go on in. Kay would probably not have followed her if the woman had not gone up to him, taken hold of the door handle, and said, I'll have to close the door after you. No one else will be allowed in. Very sensible, said Kay. But it's too full already. But then he went back in any way. He passed through between two men who were talking beside the door. One of them held both hands far out in front of himself, making the movements of counting out money. The other looked him closely in the eyes, and someone took him by the hand. It was a small, red-faced youth. Come in, come in, he said. Kay let himself be led by him, and it turned out that there was, surprisingly, in a densely packed crowd of people moving to and fro, a narrow passage which may have been the division between the two factions. This idea was reinforced by the fact that in the first few rows to the left and the right of him, there was hardly any face looking his direction. He saw nothing but the backs of people directing their speech and their movements only towards members on their own side. Most of them were dressed in black, in old, long, formal frock coats that hung down loosely around them. These clothes were o the only thing that puzzled Kay, as he would otherwise have taken the whole assembly for a local political meeting. At the other end of the hall where Kay had been led, there was a little table set at an angle on a very low podium, which was as overcrowded as everything as everywhere else. And behind the table near the edge of the podium sat a small, fat, wheezing man who was talking with someone behind him. 
The second man was standing with his legs crossed and his elbows on the, the backrest of his chair, provoking much laughter. From time to time, he threw his arm in the air as if doing a caricature of someone. The youth was, who was leading Kay had some difficulty in reporting to the man. He had already tried twice to tell him something, standing on tiptoe but without getting the man's attention as he sat there above him. It was only when one of the people on the podium drew his attention to the youth that the man turned to him and leant, leant down to hear what it was he quietly said. Then he pulled out his watch and quickly looked over at Kay. You should have been here one hour and five minutes ago, he said. Kay was going to give him a reply but had no time to do so, as hardly had the man spoken than a general muttering arose all over the right hand side of the wall. You should have been here an hour and five minutes ago, the man now repeated, raising his voice this time, and quickly looked around the hall beneath him. The muttering also became immediately louder as the man said nothing more, died away only gradually. Now the hall was much quieter, quieter than when Kay had entered. Only the people up in the gallery had not stopped passing remarks. As far as could be distinguished, up in the half-darkness, dusk and days, they seemed to be less well-dressed than those below. Many of them had brought pillows that they had put between their heads and the ceilings so that they would not hurt themselves pressed against it. Kay had decided he would do more than watching than talking, so he did not defend himself for supposedly having come late and simply said, Well, maybe I have arrived late. I'm here now. There followed loud applause once more from the right, the right side of the hall. Easy people to get on your side, thought Kay, and was bothered only by the quiet from the left-hand side, which was directly behind him and from which there was applause from only a few individuals. He wondered what he, what he could say to get all of them to support him together, if that were not possible, or if that were not possible, to at least get the support of the others for a while. So, uh, very weird, surreal situation. Uh, I think there's there's nothing much to comment on here uh, up until like about the end of this chapter, because it's at the end where I think uh, all of this starts to uh, have a basis in the text for making sense. Yeah, as the story has progressed so far. Uh, but K is definitely being weird. Uh, He's told he's late. He decides to make no excuse. You know, it's kind of which is just like, well, yeah, I'm late, but I'm here, uh, which is, uh, you know, flagrant disrespect of uh, the system. And uh, I would just like to point out that so far, as of yet, the system has not been shown to be. Uh, any great and awful bureaucracy, uh, despite how the common interpretation goes, uh, because as uh, we have already seen, and we shall see more and more, uh, that the reason Kay never finds out anything is because he doesn't bother finding out anything. Uh, he just assumes things. He assumes what time it starts, he assumes it's serious enough to go, but not serious enough to like respect in going. He assumes that these people are in factions, and all, and all of a sudden he just says something inane, sees one and half of them cheering for him. He's like, "I gotta get these people on." Like, what can I say to get all these people to be cheering for me? Like, comes out of nowhere. Uh, you know, just kind of like this weird notion he just suddenly gets of. Uh, that uh, somehow the like these people matter uh, in this trial. Uh, as far as he's aware, he doesn't know who they are. He doesn't know why they're there. Uh, they just start cheering, and he thinks that somehow this is important, uh, despite having no reason to think so. So yes, said the man, but I'm now no longer under any obligation to hear your case. There was once more a muttering, but this time it was misleading as the man waved the people's objections aside with his hand and continued, I will, however, as an exception, continue with it today, but you should never arrive late like this again. And now, step forward. Someone jumped down from the podium so that there could, 
there would be a place free for K, and K stepped up onto it. He stood pressed closely against the table. The press of the crowd behind him was so great that he had to press back against it if he did not wish to push the judge's desk down off the podium and perhaps the judge along with it. So again, uh, the system being very accommodating, despite the fact that uh, you know this is the usual interpretation is that this is a horrible oppressive system. Uh, you know that's just there kind of to fuck with you. But uh, you know, as the magistrate says, or I don't know if we know this is the magistrate yet. Uh, yeah, we don't know that it's no, magistrate yet. yet. Uh, as this person says, you know, like they, they look, he arrived late. The court has no requirements now to bother with his case, but the guy's going to be nice with him and let him have his hearing. Uh, just like the guards uh, or the policemen uh, in the prior chapter were pretty nice to him. The judge, however, paid no attention to that, but sat very comfortably on his chair and uh, and again, actually, uh, so he wasn't told who this is. He just assumes it's the judge. So the judge, however, paid no attention to that, but sat very comfortably on his chair, and after saying a few words to close his discussion with the man behind him, reached for a little notebook, the only item on his desk. It was like an old-school exercise book that had and had become quite misshapen from much thumbing. Now then, said the judge, thumbing through the book. He turned to Kay with the tone of someone who knows his facts and said, You are a house painter? No, said Kay. I am the chief clerk in a large bank. This reply was followed by laughter among the right-hand faction down in the hall. It was so hearty that Kay couldn't stop himself joining in with it. The people supported themselves with their hands on their knees and shook as if suffering a serious attack of coughing. Even some of those in the gallery were laughing. The judge had become quite cross but seemed to have no power over those below him in the hall. And he tried to reduce what harm had been done in the gallery and jumped up threatening them. His eyebrows until then, hardly remarkable, pushed themselves up and became big, black and bushy over his eyes. Big black and bushy reminds me of uh, the Mentats from uh, what's Dune. Lin Lynch's Dune. Oh, Lynch's, <laughs> yeah, particularly, yeah. Yeah, because they have those <laughs> definitely the big uh, bushy eyebrows. I don't know, so the what's kind of bushy? I mean, they're kind of weird and curled, but yeah. that's what that's the image I got in my mind. The paint houses bars reminds me of the Irishman. <laughs> I, the I Heard You Paint Houses book that it's based on. It's not about that, obviously. Yeah, no, no, it's not yeah. that. But okay, I'll, I'll comment on this because it's... Uh, I think the next paragraph goes over this, but uh, we'll see, and then I'll comment on it. So the left-hand side of the wall was still quiet, though. The people stood there in rows with their face looking towards the podium, listening to what was being said there. They observed the noise from the other side of the hall with the same quietness and even allowed some individuals from their own ranks here there to go forward into the other faction. The people in the left faction were not only fewer in number than the right, but probably were no more important than them, although their behavior was calmer and that made it seem like they were. When Kay now began to speak, he was convinced he was doing it in the same way as them. Your question, my lord, as to whether I am a house painter, in fact, even more than that, you did not ask at all, but merely imposed it on me, is symptomatic of the whole way these proceedings against me are being carried out. Perhaps you will object that there are no proceedings against me. You will be quite right, as there are proceedings only if I acknowledge that there are. But for the moment, I do acknowledge it, out of pity for yourselves to a large extent. It is impossible not to observe all this business without feeling pity. I don't say things are being done without due care, but I would like to make it clear that it is I who make the acknowledgement. I don't know that it's not a reference to him, oh, so you're a murderer or something. But I don't think it is. I don't know. There has to be some significance. Well, okay. I don't think here's, he arbitrarily chooses anything. Yeah, here, here's the significance, as I see it. It's a double. It's part of, it's part of him assuming 
things without actually knowing what things actually are. He assumes that the judge had the facts wrong from some prior misinformation. Right. But no, remember that he, uh, I think he was called poor. A, a you know like, uh, is it, uh, or maybe I'm thinking of like something. I I was I read the whole thing today, so maybe I'm quoting out of order. But this is not much of anything because uh, it's already been kind of pointed out. Uh, people feel pity for him, and they they consider him poor in that way, like you know like poor K. Poor of spirit, yeah. Yeah. Notice how all these people look poor to him now yeah, or, consider yeah. yeah consider that to them he looks poor <laughs> so when they laughed they could be laughing at him they could right. be laughing at k because like he thinks he's a bank executive right and what they see before them is a guy who's like poor ra- who's poor in rags poor in spirit a rich, a rich. yeah he so he, yeah he laughs with them in order to, you know, be like, yeah, I, I get the joke, but he doesn't. He's too yeah, narcissistic to... Yeah, because he thinks better. they're laughing at the judge, but I think it's the opposite. They're laughing at him. Oh, yeah. By for, yeah, for sure. That has to be true. So, that, and then, like, uh, here he is before the court to be heard. You know, uh, it's you know. I think did they say it was like a cross examination, right? Uh, he's going to be like questioned. Yeah. And he's pontificating to the judge, or who he assumes is the judge in this case. In in no court do you go and do this and expect a good yeah. result. Kay stopped speaking and looked down into the hall. He had spoken sharply, more sharply than he had intended, but he had been quite right. It should have been rewarded with some applause here and there, but everything was quiet. They were all clearly waiting for what would follow. Perhaps a quietness was laying the ground for an outbreak of activity that would bring this whole affair to an end. It was somewhat disturbing that just then the door at the end of the hall opened. The young washerwoman who seemed to have finished her work came in and despite all her caution attracted the attention of some of the people there. It was only the judge who gave Kay any direct pleasure, as he seemed to have been immediately struck by Kay's words. Until then, he had listened to him standing, as Kay's speech had taken him by surprise while he was directing his attention to the gallery. Now, in the pause, he sat down very slowly, as if he did not want anyone to notice. He took out the notebook again, probably so that he could give the impression of being calmer. That won't help you, sir, continued Kay. Even your little book will only confirm what I say. Kay was satisfied to hear nothing but his own quiet words in this room full of strangers, and he even dared casually to pick up the examiner, examining judge's notebook and, touching it only with the tips of his fingers, as if it were something revolting, lifted it in the air, holding it just by one of the middle pages so that the others on each side of it, closely written, blotted and yellowing, flapped down. Those are the official notes of the examining judge, he said, and let the notebook fall down onto the desk. You can read in your book as much as you like, sir. I really don't have anything in this charge book to be afraid of, even though I don't have access to it as I wouldn't want it in my hand. I can only touch it with two fingers. The judge grabbed the notebook from where it had fallen on the desk, which could only have been a sign of his deep humiliation, or at least that it, that it is how it must have been perceived, tried to tidy it up a little bit, and held it once more in front of himself in order to read from it. So, yet again, he's assuming things. You know, he knows that w- that whatever's in this book, it must be related to like his case, because the judge is reading from it. He then goes on and dismisses it and says, like, "Oh, you know, this. So this must be where like, uh, you know, the, he hasn't talked about this yet, but uh, I mean, it's kind of an obvious thing. Uh, whatever he's guilty of." The charge must be there, the, so the law that he's breaking must be somewhere there, or, or something related to it. This should be of supreme interest for somebody who's going through all this trouble just to show up. 
but he's showing up just to humiliate them. Yes, he says he's too good to he's too good to find out this law. You know, it's a crummy book. This whole place is crummy. You know, the people are dressed crummily. It's a, <laughs> the the place is crummy. Uh, the books are crummy. Uh, he's a very superficial person, uh, and I think th that's a pretty clear thing through from the very beginning of the book all the way uh, through the entire story. Uh, K K judges things very superficially and uh, well I, I think it's justified to say it here like already that uh, we can give a remark that uh, it's pretty obvious that whatever this law is is not any normal law it's pretty obvious that whatever these courts are it's not any normal court this stuff is weird uh, I'm gonna just go ahead and like relate this to a theological reading that uh, is definitely there in this book, uh, in this story. The more spiritual you get, the less materialist you get, the less you care about material things. These people, like we, we will find out very, very quickly, are caught up in this whole system where all these people live, literally just the court process, day in and day out. The, and because the court is related to the law and the law here is not a human law like uh, the law is God basically uh, you know it's God's law the divine law since that's their main focus they don't give a fuck what they look like that's why they're so shabby that's why like they, they don't spend any great effort or money or you know there's an assumption of money but like there really isn't like money's like no object in the rest of the story uh, precisely because they're they're dealing with higher things and, and K is looking at the very superficial li literally just the surface of things uh, but anyways that's just jumping ahead explanatorily but uh, it will be quickly cashed out our listeners should have read this already by themselves <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you wouldn't be looking for an explanation if, if you hadn't already read it in board, like, what the fuck does this mean? So, to do. The people in the front row looked at him, showing such tension in their faces that he looked back down at them for some time. Every one of them was an old man, some of them with white beards. Could they perhaps be a, a, the crucial group who could turn the whole assembly one way or the other? And they had sunk into a state of motionlessness while Kay gave his oration, and it had not been possible to raise them from his passivity even when the judge was being humiliated. What has happened to me? continued Kay with less of the vigor he had earlier. He could only scan the faces in the first row, and this gave his addresses a somewhat nervous and distracted character. What has happened to me is not just an isolated case. If it were, it would not be much of an important. It would not be of much importance, as it's not of much importance to me. But it is a symptom of proceedings which are carried out against many. It's on behalf of them that I stand here now, not for myself alone. Delusions of grandeur. Delusions of grandeur and lying straight up. I mean, he's been lying the entire time, but this is like, but it's been like you know, like the lies of omission uh, here he's just straight up lying he came here to com humiliate them he didn't come here to like do anything for anybody else he doesn't care about the truth the laws the downtrodden who are abused by the system and, and you will <laughs> see you'll see this literally in a couple pages Without having intended it, he had raised his voice. Somewhere in the hall, someone raised his hands and applauded him, shouting, Bravo! Why not then? Bravo! Again, I say, Bravo! Some of the men in the first row groped around in their beards. None of them looked around to see who was shouting. Not even Kay. Thought, thought him of any importance, but it did raise his spirits. He no longer thought it all necessary that all of those in the hall should applaud him. It was enough if the majority of them began to think about the matter, and if only one of them now and then was persuaded. 
seems to me he's just desperately moving the goalposts. At first he's like, how, oh, you know, I need to convince everybody, you know, because he thought he could, and then he realizes he can't. He's like, oh, well, I, I don't actually need to convince anybody. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> even that person, like, now there's only one person clapping for me, but, and that person doesn't matter. He tells himself it doesn't matter, but his action shows that that person, now he's, he's basing the value of everything he's doing on that one random person he doesn't know, who precisely because they're one random person, they don't matter. You know, this is this is like people who just have delusions in which like the rest of the world is telling you one thing and they find the one person who agrees with them who's just as delusional and they're like, oh, well, you know, like so long as one person sees the truth, you know, I'm all good. <laughs> but when before he wasn't satisfied with the left side, I was curious about that. I don't, I don't there's got to be a meaning. Different. There's got to be a meaning to the left and the right side. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what, but there's and it, it has to be an esoteric meaning. It's, it's, this is not the this is not the political left and the right. No, or the left brain right brain type thing. It's not that. High. So to do, he says, I'm not trying to be a successful orator. Or orator, I, I prefer order instead of orator. Yeah, order, order. I'm not trying to be a successful orator, said Kay, after his this thought. That's probably more than I'm capable of anyway. I'm sure the examining judge can speak far better than I can. It is part of his job, after all. All that I want is a public discussion, of a public wrong. Listen, ten days ago I was placed under arrest. The arrest itself is something I laugh about, but that's beside the point. They came for me in the morning when I was still in bed. Maybe the order had been given to arrest some house painter. That seems possible after the, what the judge has said. Someone who is as innocent as I am, but it was me they chose. There were two police thugs occupying the next room. They could not have... They could not have taken better precautions if I had been a dangerous robber. And these policemen were unprincipled riffraffs. They talked at me till I was sick of it. They wanted bribes. They wanted to trick me into giving them my clothes. They wanted my money, supposedly, so that they could bring me my breakfast after they had blatantly eaten my own breakfast in front of my eyes. And even that was not enough. I was led in front of the supervisor in another room. This was the room of a lady who had I had a lot of respect for. Uh, so much respect that he basically... Basically... Uh, Got very close to raping her. <laughs> oh, I, I forgot to bring something up. Uh, since this is, we've already mentioned that uh, this has a, a sort of uh, theological bent to it. Huge. It reminds, well, yeah, okay. So, it reminds me of Lot and his uh, story, Sodom and Gomorrah, the two cities. In Jewish custom, it was it was or you know in, in in custom in Judaism, it's very rude not to offer someone drink or food when they enter your home. So it, it just reminded me of that. They ate it because you know he didn't offer them. You know? That's true. Uh, notice again, he's lying. Yeah. Because this is not what happened. No. Now, now, in the first time I read this, I completely bought what he said <laughs> because I was listening to an audiobook, and like, you can't pay like uh, that much attention to an audiobook. Really, it's, it's the auditory and reading uh, attention, at least for me, is definitely not the same. Uh, but reading this, this is not what happened. They were very nice with him. They didn't accost him in his bed. They let him get dressed. They're just like they were pretty nice to him. They give an explanation as to why he should hand his clothes over. He did so, grudgingly, but he did so anyways. Uh, and he did so willingly, because they didn't force him. None of this was ever forced upon him. Uh, you know, it's, it's got to be brought up over and over again, because he himself brings it up over and over again. He's in this trial because he chose to be. He could have ignored them from the very beginning, but he didn't. Why didn't he? Well, you know, we've already been told that guilt draws the court process to the person. Say no. Uh, 
this just goes into some some weirdness that guilt is ontological guilt is not a feeling you are guilty this is a very strange thing to modern people but it's actually the way theology has always treated it right like like uh, and and this is a, a weird thing even for people who aren't religious uh, well you know Heidegger is a bad example because Heidegger was religious but in a very non-standard way because uh, Heidegger also thought that guilt was ontological uh, Kierkegaard thinks guilt is ontological but then Christians generally think guilt is ontological it's not it's not about feeling guilty guilt's not a feeling you are guilty so Joseph K obviously doesn't feel guilty he is nonetheless guilty and he's acting exactly the part of someone who's guilty he's the one who's putting himself under the trial you know he's brought the trial upon himself but think about it in Judaism there's no Jesus to absolve you of your sin of your guilt uh, indeed uh this comes up well we, we've already like we're spoiling a lot like we're just going to jump around the analysis there's stuff that yeah. comes up later that clearly hints uh at the knowledge that there are these thing these beings called the great uh, lawyers which nobody has ever nobody knows who they are nobody <laughs> has ever met they're just a myth but the idea is that the great lawyers are the only ones who have ever gone anybody off scot-free from the system completely that they've proven once and for all that these people were not guilty. Yep. And a great and, and like the clear implication is this is talking about the reference of Jesus primarily, but also to anyone who is like a saint, uh, you know, particularly in the Catholic Church or anybody who would intervene in divine matters for you, uh, like the Pope. You know, like uh, except you know the Pope is a bad example because the. Uh, well, like I suppose ca Catholic Catholics definitely, definitely, you know, thought like the Pope could get them out of hell just because, you know, yeah. what, is, what was the name of the things, uh, indulgences. Mm -hmm. He's an inferno too. Oh yeah, <laughs> those guys are in hell. They're, they're upside down on top of each other. Uh, anyways, um, oh yes, yeah, something yeah. I forgot to mention last time. The arrest. Mm. There, there's three, three levels to the arrest. He's arrested psychologically. This becomes clear because once this whole process starts, his mind is, cannot stop thinking about it. Despite how he's, he says he doesn't care, how he's different, he does nothing but go back to it. So he's arrested in that he's not He's not capable of moving on. So when he was told, you're arrested, but you're free to move around, he's like, well, then how is an arrest? Well, that's how. He's spiritually arrested. So he's spiritually arrested in that his mind is now stuck on thinking about the trial. He can't think about anything else, for the most part, as things go on. He's spiritually arrested also in that uh, arrested development. Uh, he's a fucking man-child. He's also arrested on a metaphysical level. This story is also a Gnostic story, like straight up. Like th that, that, on that interpretation, Giorgiani is definitely right. There is a clear Gnostic, heavy Gnostic bent in this story. Mm. He's arrested that he's a very surface level materialist person. He is stuck in the prison of materialism. And that prison is literally, you're like, well, how am I in prison? This world, the material world, is the prison. And if you can't look beyond the material, which he can't, you know, like he, he can't look past, like they're all shabby dressed, their books are old, the offices are terrible, they're at the worst places, and he's like, oh, you know, these people are unprofessional, blah, blah, blah. He's not looking at what the content of what they do, he's looking at the surface show, which is precisely what the Demiurge wants you to do. Right. You know that's how you that's how you get stuck here that you never look past the material you know you get stuck in the surface of desires you know it's a circle of samsara 
so that's why it makes sense that he is under arrest so all right to do, do so uh so and these policemen were on principled riffraff they taught them me till I was sick of it no they didn't they wanted bribes they wanted to trick me into giving them my clothes they wanted my money supposed that they could bring me my breakfast after they had blatantly eaten my own breakfast from my eyes yeah, supposedly <laughs> yeah, yeah supposedly he, you know he didn't even bother telling them okay fine go get me breakfast and they probably would have got him his breakfast yeah, he's coming up with this on the spot uh, yeah, not only that. Uh, he never thought about this before. He never considered this. Yeah, yeah, he, he yeah. Uh, not only that, they took his breakfast, and he never asked his landlady, "Hey, they ate my breakfast. Could you give me another one?" He never asked her that. <laughs> you get one? She probably, she probably would have said, "Oh, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, here's, here's a breakfast for you." He never bothered trying it. So he's saying something which he doesn't even know is true because he doesn't know that the negative was was even a a possibility. He just assumed it wasn't like he's an idiot. He keeps assuming things. Uh, I mean like, like literally, right? Like you you, you know yeah. the, the classical definition of, of idiot, the, the idiot, you know, in Greek. It's literally somebody who's just a private person who doesn't care about public affairs and other people. Yeah. He's also so he's, he's an idiot in that person sense. Person yeah. that is not uh, part of the community. Yeah. I suppose that's actually related to idiosyncratic, isn't it? So it sounds like yeah. that, that sounds like it is. Yeah. Because it's a uh, very individual. Mm -hmm. He's an idiot, and he's being just blatantly stupid. But he thinks he's a know-it-all. He, you know, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know who these people are. But he always just assumes he already knows everything. He puts on a front, a facade of a know-it-all. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. He wants everyone else to think he's he's a suit. He he wants everyone else to think he knows everything. So he right. cares and about he, only about appearance. appearance. Yeah, exactly. He, it's 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 all appearance with him. So okay, the ape his own be uh, they ate his breakfast in front of his eyes. And even that was not enough. I was led in front of the supervisor in another room. That was the room of a lady who I had a lot of respect for. Yeah, right? And I was forced to look on while the supervisor's policeman made quite a mess of this room because of me, although not through any fault of mine. Uh, it wasn't... You know, when you go back to the first chapter, it was kind of a weird arrangement, but it wasn't that big of a mess. Uh, like, the, the, the messiest thing was just, like, they, they hung a blouse on the wall. Did uh, they knock over a picture, one of the three? Uh, the, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so, and then they place it back in the wrong order. Right. Uh, but it was because of him, because he, he like, went next to them, like suddenly like yelled something, and then you know they kind of got startled. But he never takes responsibility. Yeah, he didn't even know who they were at that point. <laughs> yeah, because uh, he doesn't pay attention to who. Who is who until things uh, have transpired, and then he's like, "Wait, how did I not notice who that was?" Well, because you're an emotional self -absorbed. moron, self-absorbed, uh, yeah, self-absorbed emotional moron. <laughs> so, uh, it was not easy to stay calm, but I managed to do so, and was completely calm when I asked the supervisor why it was that I was under arrest. If you were if he were here, he would have to confirm what I say. I can see him now sitting on the chair belonging to that lady I mentioned. A picture of dull-witted arrogance. What do you think he answered? What he told me, gentlemen, was basically nothing at all. Basically, he really did know nothing. 
He had placed me under arrest and was satisfied. In fact, he had done more than that and brought three junior employees from the bank where I work into the lady's room. They had made themselves busy interfering with some photographs that belonged to the lady and causing a mess. There was, of course, another reason for bringing these employees. They, just like my landlady and her maid, were expected to spread the news of my arrest and damage my public reputation and in particular to remove me from my position at the bank. Well, they didn't succeed in any of that, not in the slightest. Even my landlady, who's quite a simple person, and I will give you here her name in full respect. Her name is Mrs. Grubach. Even Mrs. Grubach was understanding enough to see that an arrest like this has no more significance than an attack carried out on the street by some youths who are not kept under proper control. I mean, you, you, you gotta, like, he self owns, <laughs> and people don't, the fact that people don't notice is just amazing. He's like, and even my landlady, who's a really stupid person, <laughs> could see that this was bullshit. <laughs> Uh, I would definitely trust somebody who I believe is a stupid person to be the person who I point to see even that dumbass agrees with me <laughs> uh, amazing intellect he has I repeat this whole affair was ca has caused me nothing but unpleasantness and temporary irritation but could it not have also have had some far worse consequences Kay broke off here and looked at the judge who said nothing. As he did so, he thought he saw the judge use a movement of his eyes to give a sign to someone in the crowd. Kay smiled and said, And now the judge right next to me is giving a secret sign to someone among you. There seems to be someone among you who is taking directions from above. I don't know whether the sign is meant to produce a booing or applause, but I'll resist trying to guess what it means. It's what its meaning is too soon. It really doesn't matter to me, and I'll, I give his leadership to judge my full and public permission to stop giving secret signs to his paid subordinate down there, and give his orders in words instead. Let him just say, boo now, and then the next time, clap now. Again, assuming things. Whether it was embarrassment or impatience, the judge rocked backwards and forwards on his seat. So, this happens a lot in this book. You'll be told the two perspectives. And the fact that Kay is aware of the two perspectives and chooses to assume always the worst. Uh, and the worst is always obviously what he wants. He wants to embarrass a judge, so he's like, it could have been embarrassment or impatience. But you know, I want to embarrass him, so you know, it's gotta be embarrassment. Uh, I think it's I think it's I think almost anything that Kay ever says or thinks about anyone is almost always the opposite. Of what is actually going to be the case <laughs> the man behind him whom he had been talking with earlier leant forward again either to give him a few general words of encouragement or some specific piece of advice below them in the hall the people talked to each other quietly but it animatedly the two factions had earlier seemed to hold views strongly opposed to each other but now they began to intermingle a few individuals pointed up at k others pointed at the judge the air in the room was foggy and it's extremely oppressive. Those who were standing furthest away could hardly even be seen through it. It must have been especially troublesome for those visitors who were in the were in the gallery, as they were forced to quietly ask the participants in the assembly what exactly was happening, albeit with timid glances at the judge. The replies they received were just as quiet and given behind the protection of a raised hand. I have nearly finished what I have to say, said Kay. And as there was no bell available, he struck the desk with his fist in a way that startled the judge and his advisor and made them look up from each other. None of this concerns me, and I am therefore able to make a calm assessment of it, and assuming that this so-called court is of any real importance, it will be very much to your advantage to listen to what I have to say. If you want to discuss what I say, please don't bother to write it down until later on. I don't have any time to waste, and I'll soon be leaving. There was immediate silence, which showed how well Kay was in control of the crowd. There were no shouts among them, as there had been at the start. No one even applauded him, but if they weren't already persuaded, they seemed very close to it. Unreliable narrator. <laughs> <laughs> Yet again, assuming. I mean, uh, can't possibly another reason people would be stunned into silence. <laughs> I'd say, you know, he's got quite some caucasity. Okay. 
Cassidy command. <laughs> <laughs> the caucasity of this man. Kay was pleased at the tension among all the people there as they listened to him. A result, a rustling rose from a silence which was more invigorating than the most ecstatic applause could have been. There is no doubt, he said quietly, that there is some enormous organization determining what is said by this court. In my case, this includes my arrest and the examination taking place here today, an organization that employs policemen who can be bribed, oafish supervisors and judges of whom nothing better can be said than that, than that they are not as arrogant as some others. This organization even maintains a high-level judiciary, along with its train of countless servants, scribes, policemen, and all their assistants that it needs, perhaps even executioners and torturers. I'm not afraid of using those words. And what, gentlemen, is the purpose of this enormous organization? Its purpose is to arrest innocent people and wage pointless prosecutions against them, which, as in my case, lead to no result. How are we to avoid those in this in office becoming deeply corrupt when everything is devoid of meaning? That is impossible. Not even this highest, the highest judge would be able to achieve that for himself. That is why policemen try to steal the clothes off the back of those they arrest. That is why supervisors break into the homes of people they do not know. That is why innocent people are humiliated in front of crowds rather than being given a proper trial. The policemen often talked about the warehouses where they put the property of those they arrest. I would like to see these warehouses where they are the hard-won possessions of people under arrest is left to decay. If that is, it's not stolen by the thieving hands of the warehouse workers. Yeah, the law exists only to limit the innocent. There's nothing, to, nobody's ever guilty of anything. It's already been told to him that uh, if they come after you, it's because mm -hmm. you are guilty. Second, they told him, because there's not been anybody who's ever not been guilty, the trials are not pointless. Third, because everyone is guilty in the end, <laughs> nobody's going to get their shit back, which is might as well, you know, the people who watch over the warehouse, what are they going to do? Just keep a massive stuff that's never going to get you back? Nah, you know, so that's why they end up like taking it for themselves and selling it off and pawning it off. Uh, and it comes up later that it's it's not even like that there's some kind of like a racketeering of this stuff going on, mm. ultimately. Uh, that's how a lot of these people get their clothes. Like, they're all wearing shabby clothes. Like, these people dress poor. They 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 work in poor conditions. Horrible conditions. In K's eyes. Yeah. yeah. They're pushed up against the ceiling. Yeah, like really <laughs> bizarre conditions. You know, no, nobody wants really? to work with it. You only work in that if you actually want to. And st this double. The inversion of values is very clear. Uh, both on uh, the material presentation you can already tell in the way in which the people in the court conduct themselves in regard to him and how he conducts himself in regard to them they've been very nice to him so far and he's just a fucking asshole uh, who sh is completely disrespectful shows no respect for the process uh, and uh, well, it's going to be said right now, actually, so I'm not going to... Yeah. I'll comment it after. <sighs> My favorite part. Kay was interrupted by a screeching from the far end of the hall. He shaded his eyes to see that far, and the dull light of day made the smoke whitish and hard to see through. It was the washerwoman whom Kay had recognized as like a likely source of disturbance as soon as she had entered. It was hard to see how now whether it was her fault or not. Kay could only see that a man had pulled her into a corner by the door and was pressing himself against her. But it was not her who was screaming, but the man. He had opened his mouth wide and looked up at the ceiling. A small circle had formed around the two of them. The visitors near him in the gallery seemed delighted that the serious tone Kay had introduced him to the gallery had been disturbed in this way. Kay's first thought was to run over there, and he also thought everyone would want to bring things back into order there or at least to make their pair the pair leave the room but the first row of people in front of him stayed where they were 
No one moved and no one let K through. On the contrary, they stood in his way. Old men held out their arms in front of him and a hand from somewhere, he did not have the time to turn around, took hold of his collar. K by this time had forgotten about the pair. It seemed to him that his freedom was being limited as if his arrest was being taken seriously. And without any thought for what he was doing, he jumped down from the podium. Now he stood face to face with the crowd. Had he judged the people properly? Had he put too much faith in the effect of his speech? Had they been putting up a pretense all the time that he had been speaking, and now that he had come to the end and to what must follow, were they tired of pretending? What faces they were all around him, dark little eyes flickered here and there, cheeks drooped down like on drunken men, the long beards were thin and stiff. If they took hold of them, it was more like they were making their hands into claws, not as if they were taking hold of their own beards. But underneath those beards, and this was the real discovery made by Kay, there were badges of various sizes and colors shining on the collars of their coats. As far as he could see, every one of them was wearing one of these badges. All of them belonged to the same group, even though they seemed to be divided to the right and the left of him. And when he suddenly turned around, and he saw the same badge on the collar of the examining judge, who calmly looked down at him with his hands on his lap. So, called out Kay, throwing his arms in the air as if this sudden realization needed more room, all of you are working for this organization. I see now, yeah, I see now that you are all the very bunch of cheats and liars I've just been speaking about. You've all pressed yourselves in here in order to listen in and snoop on me. You gave the impression of having formed into factions. One of you even applauded me to test me out, and you wanted to learn how to trap an innocent man. Well, I hope you haven't come here for nothing. I hope you've either had some fun from someone who expected you to defend his innocence or else. Let go of me or I'll hit you, shouted Kay to a quiver quivery old man who had pressed himself especially close to him, or else that you've actually learned something, and so I wish you good luck in your trade. He briskly took his hat from where it lay on the edge of the table and, surrounded by silence, caused perhaps by the completeness of their surprise, pushed his way to the exit. However, the examining judge seems to have moved even more quickly than Kay, as he was waiting for him at the doorway. One moment, he said. K stood there where he was, but looked at the door with his hand already in his handle rather than at the judge. I merely wanted to draw your attention, said the judge, to something you seem not yet to be aware of. Today you have robbed yourself of the advantages that a hearing of this sort always gives to someone who is under arrest. K laughed towards the door. You bunch of louts, he called. You can all keep all your hearings as a present from me. Then opened the door and hurried down the steps. Behind him, the noise of the assembly rose as it became lively once more and probably began to discuss these events as if making a scientific study of them. End of chapter 2. So who were these people? <laughs> they were the jury. He thought it was just some fucking crowd there who was just there to, to gawk and see. Well, no, these are the peers which will be judging him. The jury of and his peers. He, and he <laughs> has he is not given a good show uh, as an innocent man. Immediately he lashes out once he figures out that they're all working for the courts, that they're all part of the process. And then he says, and yeah, he assumes, yeah, he assumes, uh, but it's a good assumption because uh, he sees that they're connected. Yeah. Uh, and he just lashes out at them and then says, "Oh, you're tr all trying to entrap me," but they didn't do anything. They never said anything. <laughs> he just assumes shit. They're all in cahoots. It's paranoid. Yep. He's right to be paranoid. <laughs> but he's right, it's yeah. It's yeah. pathological. <laughs> it's pathological. Uh, I mean, the interesting thing is, of course, uh, like, what is it? This, this is probably kind of, this seems to me like it's kind of a hearkening to, like, the way Jewish law was practiced. Yeah, 
so-called, uh, in which, like, you know, like there, there was an idea of the jury of your peers, but there was, like, it was the elders who judged you, and all these people were old men. Yeah, they're all old men, most with white beards. So very sagely wise looking, you know, that's a, that's a, an indication, it's not just, oh, they're old men. So, I mean, uh, what was it? The two major reactions that he got out of the crowd is the, so far in this was uh, the laughter over the painter thing, in which uh, my interpretation is they were laughing at him, clearly. Uh, the other one is... Uh, what was it? Uh, the cheer. Uh, when he claimed that he was there on behalf of those who were wrongly accused. And half of the crowd cheered for him. Uh, now the way, the way these juries work is not like a regular jury but it's not completely alien to it either uh, so part of it is indeed you present the case to convince the jury so his assumption there even even if he had first assumed that they were just a crowd uh, and he was kind of you know trying to rile them up to humiliate the judge humiliate the court When he made that thing, that he, when he made the claim, which was a lie, that he was there on behalf of all those other people that, that might be wrongly, you know, uh, indicted, the, the side that cheered was a side that, like, you know, took it at face value and said, you know, and took it to be a good sign of his character. Mm -hmm. a, but again, part, part of the trial is who he is, uh, regards his character. So, you know, those people, for that moment, they're like, oh, well, you know, he's a good shine of character, you know. Great, go on. Uh, and the other side, you know, is probably a bit skeptical about it. Regarding the right. side, though. Oh, uh, sorry, I knew you were going to Yeah, just let me finish that. Uh, but by the end, we can tell that, uh, given his showing, the, the doubts between the sides faded. And to me, it's clear that they, they didn't fade in his favor. That yes. whatever, whatever people he started with on his side weren't on his side by the end. Right. Correct. So the left side is generally historically seen as weak. So that could be one meaning. Uh, that they were weak at first, and then as it progressed, they changed, they learned, they grew, and had uh, an equivalency with the right side, you know, who was stronger from the beginning. You know, so at the beginning they were weak, they were on its side, then, you know, as it, as it proceeds, they are no longer on its side. Oh, okay, so in Jewish uh, symbolism, mm -hmm. the right hand, the open right hand, is a sign of protection that also represents blessings, power, and strength, seen as potent in deflecting the evil eye. Uh, the left hand comes from Samael, the angel of death and the <laughs> prince of demons, who, according to the Talmud, sits on God's left. Yep. So, uh, yeah, the left side the simile s certainly seems to be the side that would be uh, convicting him. Uh, they were pretty somber. Uh, other symbolisms, uh, God uses temporal rewards and punishments in the left-hand kingdom, but faith can be created only through the means of the right-hand kingdom. So uh, there's probably a lot more meaning to that. Uh, it's probably get, getting more into Jewish esotericism. Uh, uh, I'll look into that because it, it is meaningful. Actually, all like everything, yeah. all this stuff is, is meaningful. Um, the Just woman, so the woman, her Washer. black eyes. Oh yeah, yeah. She yeah, she has Washer. black eyes. She has black hair. Uh, Just shining black eyes, black hair. She stops what she's doing, lifts her wet hands, and points. 
Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. She she, she immediately knew what he was there for, despite the fact that he was lying about what he was there for. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's a. Uh, this comes up later on as well. It it's already come up already, anyways. Uh, guilt attracts the law, and anybody who's working with a law has a a guilt sense. You know, guilt o meter or you know, spider sense for guilt let's say <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so they can tell already and uh, realistically speaking I mean surely this is a story so the whole thing is tons of symbolism giant metaphors uh, but generally as human beings we also tend to have a, a decent not guilt o meter but you know like we can kind of tell when people are being disingenuous unless somebody is like a very practiced and seasoned liar uh, in which case uh, you end up finding out that they're a liar anyways because uh, uh, they're pathological <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so anyways so these courts are real they're not the regular courts uh, I've already said like a we find out later they're going to be they're very much the metaphors directly that these are related to the divine law uh, he's taking it seriously enough that he bothers wasting his time to go through this process but uh, on the conscious level he's in denial and he keeps shitting on the process and I mean it, it, if you're going to put yourself in this process because he put himself through it and then you're in denial as to what you put yourself into well there are consequences and uh, that's a lot of what this book is about there will be consequences there already have been consequences uh, they, they will become apparent as we go on but anyways that was the end of chapter 2 uh, very enjoyable uh, I gotta say that today since I released I the whole thing uh, this book hit hard in a really like it, it's I think it's like the first time I have ever felt this way with a work of literature actually because uh, another big theme here is the thing from the very beginning he could have just not gone through with all this but he decided to he let it happened to him you know by being indifferent uh, in the wrong way he could have been indifferent and he's like you know just laughed out and, and kept on going his life uh, but he brought it upon himself by deciding to go through the process because it wasn't forced on him uh, I think this is a really great book <laughs> which uh, most people won't understand this way about how uh, a lot of shit in your life is all because you did something that you didn't have to do that brought it upon you uh, mostly these are issues to do with interpersonal issues I think most clearly uh, where a lot of our interpersonal problems are really just issues yeah it's not just on us it's on the other people but uh, on the side that's on us it is a large part things that we have done to alienate ourselves from other people uh, I certainly have that in spades in my life let me tell you <laughs> so and I think a lot of people do and they're in denial about it uh, but anyways re reading this book just kind of like reminded me strongly about that and how uh, I'm aware that I do that and uh, I should definitely stop doing that now I've, I've worked over that on, over the years but I I'm aware deeply aware that I still have a lot more to do and that a lot of that doing uh, is stagnated uh, by my cowardice to not do it so anyways uh, so this book has become a, a bit personal now uh, in a way in which like there's a you know the the abstract metaphysical stuff and the symbolic stuff which uh, I would definitely love uh, and that's what kind of caught my that's what caught my attention the first time I read it besides it being just a, a very good story very entertaining uh, 
but sometimes sometimes works of literature can be messages uh, from on high I'll leave you with that see you around